Matthew Glenn, and I'm the Vice President of Product Management for Lumio. So what I'm going to try to do is, so we've all been watching a lot of PowerPoint here for the last uh, few minutes. I want to actually spin this around and actually make it into actually real stuff, okay? So um, I'm going to do a few different demos for you. Um, and in doing so, the, my goal here is to sort of tie uh, the original diagram where we talked about the architecture of the product into what's actually happening inside of the, uh, in our customers. And I'll start off in the small, and then we'll go to the large, okay? Because I think in order to build a, 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 a good uh, house, you have to start with the firm foundation. So let's log in. Um, I'm gonna start off with just really getting you to the context and telemetry that we talked about. Um, so remember when the VEN came up, it was gonna send some context and telemetry up to the policy compute engine. That was the first thing that actually happens. So um, I can basically hone in on any one of these workloads. And the first thing you'll notice is we're sending information like the, uh, the IP address information. That's information that's used in the computation of the graph of relationships um, that's sent up to the policy computer. Because remember, at the end of the day, what's going to happen is a set of ACLs that get pushed down into the operating system. Um, and you know, it's an important thing to note that if, it has, if anyone's used IP tables before, it's not quite like a, you know, an ACL list on a router or, or a switch. It's a lot more complex to configure. We put a lot of effort and energy into actually making that work. And the way we do that is we're not just putting IP addresses, we actually use IP sets. Um, IP sets allows us to, like, you know, in the case of, let's imagine you had a development environment with 5,000 hosts in it. We turn that into one rule, and that one rule becomes one set, which maps very nicely into the dimensionality that PJ spoke to. The other thing you'll notice is um, you'll actually see the rail labels, and we're going to keep we're going to keep turning that because it's a very important part of where we uh, what one of the, a few of our innovations. The rail labels um, in this case, this is a web uh, role. Think about the role as PJ said as the part that an individual workload plays in an overall application. Um, a lot of our customers, I can sort of describe what they land. They'll have like, you know, between 15 and 50 roles inside their environment. We don't constrain them. You can have 2,000, but sort of one of the things they do is they go through a process of mapping out, you know, the roles. The, where we see a lot of explosion, where they have a lot of sort of like business intent, like business specific, is actually in the applications, right? So, um, and I'll show you some, a really interesting customers data here in a few moments. So you can have as many different applications as you want. We don't constrain that. Um, the third one is environment. So you could think dev, test, staging, prod. You could think of prod high security, prod low security. You could think PCI. You could think HIPAA. Whatever type of a thing you want to basically put a bubble around, uh, we can do that. And then finally, location. And sometimes location could be actually US. It could be RAC, as PJ said. Some people use that as just application instance. Um, and I'll show you why in, in a few moments. Um, once again, you're not constrained on any, how deep you want to make any one of these dimensions. Uh, most of our customers come to us, like they'll start off say, I want seven dimensions, and most of them only use like three or four of them, okay? Um, last thing I'll say is we can segment based on any combination of these labels. So you could say, I want US to talk to US, and we will plumb rules that allow all US to talk to all US. Or I want all dev to talk to all dev, we'll make a rule that says all dev could talk to all dev. So you can basically use these in any different ways to create segmentation policies. And uh, what's important about this is um, it gives you a lot of flexibility and these map directly into creating the IP sets that we were talking about a little bit earlier. Um, a quick other note, the individual workload doesn't really know what its labels are. That's an important point. So if somebody gets on a host, they can't say, oh, I'm going to change this from dev to prod and now have full access, right? This is centrally controlled from the policy compute engine. Um, so there's no self-identification uh, actually on the individual host. Um, and then finally, I'll say the processes are brought up uh, on the individual host. So this is another thing that's brought up in the policy computation. One of the nice things I like about the product is um, if you don't go, you don't know. So if you're not at the host, you don't really know everything that's running on it. This gives us a lot of information in creating the graph. Um, one of the other things that this has allowed us to do is we've seen, you know, some customers will have very coarse rules, like I want all dev to talk to all dev. That seems, you know, pretty straightforward. Some people will put like an application ring fencing rule. I want everything in ERP to talk to ERP, and we'll give you some demos of that. We have some customers, and this is going to be what's old is new again, that will run 
20 copies of Sybase on an individual OS instance, but they're on a set of successive ports, right? So one's on 3,500, one's on 3,501, and they actually need, they need process level segmentation. Being able to go down to the process on the host allows us to do process level segmentation. And when you think about Docker, Docker is just an image, it is a container where you need to do container level segmentation. So once again, we've been doing this for some period of time and we can do segment down on the process. Quick note about Linux versus Windows. Um, Windows allows us to get down to the individual process with the path information. Linux doesn't allow us to do that because we have a very strong credo, no kernel mods. So when the Linux community decides that they want to be able to do, go down to the process and give better information about the process, we can actually add that on. But right now, that's not currently available, OK? Um, so that's the top part of our loop. And that's being fed up to the policy compute engine. Now, the policy compute engine itself, this one's running in uh, our demo environment, which is out there inside of AWS. But as Alan said earlier, the vast majority of our customers actually take the PCE on-prem, OK? That, that was one of those uh, things that we realized in uh, 2013. We were cloud first, it's gonna be a cloud, everything's gonna be Amazon, Azure, et cetera. But what we've learned since then is most of our customers not just take it on-prem, uh, we actually made a big point of departure compared to a lot of organizations. We don't deliver the PCE as a virtual appliance. We actually deliver it as software. So when we say software, you run on Red Hat uh, and you spin it up as an RPM. So that, what that allows us to do is to actually take advantage of the scale out um, that we built it as SaaS. So we, we built it, we'd be able to scale super wide very quickly. Um, when we deliver the PCE right now, we deliver it as RPM. So if you want to add more capacity to serve more nodes, you can absolutely do that. So we're not constrained by you know, uh, an ISO image or a virtual appliance. You basically get, the, 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 our customers get the benefit of all the work we did to build scale out software and it can be configured as such, okay? So um, let's go take a look at a couple of different uh, policies here. So earlier PJ said um, that, you know, when we write a policy, we, uh, we will uh, um, you use it in natural language. And this is one of those things that we also learned along the way. We really put, made an effort to make it simple uh, to use. When we first started shipping the product, and PJ talked about this earlier, we had a single dimensional policy model. And a single dimensional policy model is you can add as many tags as you want and say they can talk to as many tags as you want. And what, we ended up hap what ended up happening was our policies, when we were just securing our own infrastructure, were pages and pages of long. And we realized that we overbuilt complexity. And, what we, and the four dimensional policy model was sort of born out of that. I'm gonna show you how you write a policy on the host before we get to the illumination stuff, which is I think what everyone's sort of excited about. Um, I'm gonna make a new policy, and we'll call it uh, tech day policy. And I'm gonna make it for an application called, uh, we'll call um, B2B port or port or port or, and I'll say it's in the PSA environment in uh, uh, Azure, okay? Now, a couple important points here. You can write a policy without ever even having any, any workloads part of it. So you can sort of create your default policy and it will inherit that. And the classic rule that a lot of our customers write is as follows. They'll say like, I'm gonna have, um, I want my Nginx load balancers or I'm gonna have, here are my bare metal servers. Oops, sorry about that. I'm gonna have, uh, one second, sorry about that. I know what I did wrong, sorry, one moment. Let me go back here. I can't see the whole thing, give me a moment. I'm gonna have a Prenda, okay, then I'll add this. I'm gonna have my legacy systems all services accessible from headquarters. And if I save this, what we're doing is basically saying, using this IP list called headquarters, we're going to describe that we want anybody labeled headquarters to be able to access my legacy systems. And then I can, uh, I can add in additional policies for this that would effectively um, actually, I've written this policy wrong. I apologize. I'm going to discard it real quickly. I apologize. 
let me find the rules. There we go. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to add to this one. I'm going to say headquarters can be used by web. That's an IP list. An IP list is simply a set of subnets that you want to be able to add in that doesn't have a VEN on it. I want databases to be able to talk to databases. That's a, for database synchronization. I want web to be able to talk to the database, and I want databases to be able to talk to storage. What, it's a very natural way of describing what you want to have happen. The policy compute engine, what it's going to do based on those labels, it's going to basically anything labeled web can be used by headquarters. The IP address is called headquarters. Anything labeled database can talk to database. And it's going to basically compute what the IP address is, what the ports are, what the protocols, and write them down into the individual workloads. So that's basically literally how we started when we were uh, creating policies. And what ended up happening was we realized we had a fundamental problem. And the fundamental problem that we had was that um, we did not, we, there was no way to take somebody that had a brownfield environment and make it work in this world, right? Um, we, we were out talking to customers and everyone seemed to love what we were doing because there was no reliance on the underlying infrastructure. But unfortunately, with that, with that, there wasn't a lot of people that were completely inside of Amazon or Azure. There wasn't just a lot of out there. There was a lot of legacy systems out there. And out of that very particular problem, we ended up having to do an entire set of innovations. And this was around 20, late 2013, early 2014, uh, 2014 when we started on this. And Illumination was sort of born out of that very particular problem. So uh, what we just basically covered was how to author policy if you know exactly what you want to have happen. Um, now I'm going to actually talk about what happens when you have no idea about what's going on and Illumination was actually born out of that. So I'm going to start my next section there. Before, any questions before I get going? Yeah, so before you move on, um, one of the items you have in that list is like iSCSI and MySQL. One of the common questions that we get a lot is, what kind of latency or performance impact is this going to add? Because iSCSI is pretty low latency application. And then there's a lot of these host-based solutions that we keep hearing about. You know, you're not the only company that has, we have this host-based solution that does this cool thing. And to get that close to the application, to give Ethan some credit for bringing that up, you know, if we want to get that close to the application, we have to be on the host. But how much performance are we going to see? I'm going to tell you, I'm not going to, you can read about our performance, right? We're using what's already inside of the host, right? IP tables, IP sets are well documented. Uh, at the Windows filtering platform is well documented. Don't ask me what the performance information is. It's all out there on the internet. Um, remember, we're not doing any kernel mods. The packets are not going up into user space, okay? The packets stay inside the kernel, right? So we're not adding any more latency than what was already in there would actually add to the actual application. Do you want anything to that, PJ? No, I mean, the, the only other thing to add is, I mean, as I sort of said earlier on, the VEN is kind of a control plane element. The cost of the VEN, right, yes, it does some introspection, but it's, it's relatively right weight. All the data path processing, where you started talking about packet latency, mm -hmm. right, it would be in the, you know, Linux kernel itself, right? And that's what Matt sort of saying, the information is out there. It, it is kind of IP tables or WFP latency. We do have a team that understands how to, how to set up IP tables in a very efficient way, right? How to program it. You can think of IP tables as our instruction set, and the PCE is kind of a compiler for that. We, uh, we have a team focused on making sure that you know, that can be done efficiently, and so, some knobs to be able so to So the VEN is really just orchestrating the existing operating system stuff to get what you want. So if I turn on Secure Connect, as an example, the feature I yep. see on the screen there, what you're doing is you're just going and turning on IPsec between those two boxes if it was a Windows machine. We're activating what's already there. Right. So that is one of our, our whole thing is no kernel mods activate what's already inside of the host, right? So um, it's, a, it's a little bit of a, you know, when you think about Illumio, when you really think about Illumio, it's network meets host, right? It's the ACLs that you previously had in the infrastructure, but you're pushing them down. And there's a lot of, think about if you had 10,000 hosts, and you had to write firewall rules for 10,000 hosts. That would be a lot of overhead. Um, what PJ invented was actually, what, what I love about it, when I think about layer two, we have spanning tree. Spanning tree basically ensures we don't have loops and it finds a layer two forwarding topology out there, right? And that, that's nice if everything was layer two and we could all go home and like, probably wouldn't be having this uh, day today. Then we layer layer three on top of that, right? Layer three will find a way to connect uh, two things, right? Now, it doesn't have any concept of what should happen. The beauty of IP, 
IP will find a way from point A to point B. It's super reliable. What PJ invented- Like the breeding of dinosaurs in Jurassic Park. <laughs> IP will find a way to connect two things. Yeah. Lumio was, should they connect? Yeah, P yeah. PJ invented an algorithm. When we first started, it was the first algorithm that figured out whether things should connect, right? And then we activate what's inside of the host to make that happen, right? And that's actually what I think the beauty of it. It's network meets host, and it's really the first algorithm that does that dynamically. People talk about the uh, about being able to compute, you know, what the you know sort of using these different policy models right now, what they think should happen. But if you don't have all the context and telemetry, it's sort of difficult to figure that out. Mm -hmm. um, we see things where someone will add an interface onto a VM, right, and uh, or somebody changes the configuration on a host, and now there's a new process that forks up on that host. And should it actually be opened up to the world? Like, um, and so one of the things that we do, the context from that host that we started off showing you, coupled with the algorithm that computes what actually how that should be manifested in terms of IP tables, really turns segmentation into a different thing, right? When we first thought about VLANs, it was a way of containing broadcast domains, right? Allowing layer two networks to scale. We've sort of conflated that concept with security, right? And so segmentation, in our vernacular, segmentation is actually the enforcement of policy at the host, it's not necessarily a network cons construct, as it were. You've got the VEN, uh -huh. which reports locally significant facts uh -huh. that allows you to compute some sort of topology of what can talk to what. Is that roughly the same as what's where the enforcement takes place? Well, the, remember, the, the, the VEN is control plane, as PJ says. Right. The enforcement is IP tables. Right, so the VEN then speaks to IP tables and says, this is what you can and cannot do. Yes. OK, cool. So, so then my next question, obviously, you'll need to embed that somewhere, right? Um, let's say you're running OpenStack and you have a whole bunch of VMs. Is the VEN built into your images? Uh, so once again, we cannot, as a, our, we cannot dictate how our customers are going to use the product. That's one of our other yeah. things, right? I'm just, so yeah. uh, if it's you know, Puppet Manifest, boom, you can install the VEN that way. People can bake the VEN into the image. Okay. We see that. In fact, one of the demos we're going to do in a minute will sort of show you that. Um, but we can't dictate how our customer is going to use, the, use it. Earlier, the question you asked earlier about how Puppet manifests, uh, being able to sort of describe what you want, or uh, Docker Compose, yeah. uh, how you wanted to actually uh, have policy. We actually have customers that do not even use our, the, our, our UI to write policy. They actually have an existing sort of manifest or uh, yeah. composed sort of infrastructure, and they program the rules directly into the PCE. We cannot dictate how our customers are using the product. It's all, we have a bunch of APIs and people just plug whatever, however they want into it. Yeah, I guess I was more asking what, what's commonly done. And then that leads to my next question, which is related. Uh, how has that changed when you talk about containerized workloads? Um, because then if you're talking about workloads that run a single process, uh -huh. where does your tooling fit in? Is it on the host? Is it in the container? How does that work? So again, I know you guys don't dictate that, but like, what have you what have you seen? No, so 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 generally, it is in the host itself, right? And this is where um, things are evolving into having actually some local decision, local policy decisions based on containers coming up or sort of down, and having the Venn be able to sort of um, the the policy is delivered from the PCE, but the Venn can make some local decisions based on context changes that are occurring on the host itself. Right. So, so since you guys are pretty bound to IP tables within a Linux context, does yep. that mean that your container networking solution needs to leverage IP tables, or can you plug into something else? It does. It just needs to cooperate with, um, you know, um, uh, you know, the bridge mode or flannel or you know Calico, right, mm -hmm. and be able to sort of cooperate and play, you know, friendly in that space. And you're seeing customers do. We we do see customers sort of beginning to sort of okay. uh, you know adopt those things. Cool. Thank you. So, have you? Partnered with any other endpoint security vendors, and to what extent? Um, have we partnered with any other endpoint security vendors? Um, not, not as of yet. So, um, so the uh, the we actually have a a third party Venn API that a third party could take our our rules from. Um, no one's used that as of yet, but we're totally open to it. One of the one of the things that we see is our use of sets, IP sets. Uh, basically is a huge benefit. Like, you know, if you think about, Alan talked about one of the big use cases that our customers have is, I want a dev prod sec, right? A lot of customers that we've seen, not, you guys are all IT admins, so you'll, you've probably forgotten more than I'll ever know about this, but a lot of customers that we see actually didn't have 
perfect hygiene in dev prod seg, right? They actually, a lot of them have dev and prod commingled on the exact same subnets, right? So to do dev prod segregation without retro segment or retro VLANing your infrastructure is pretty darn difficult. So the way that we handle that is we use IP sets to, so instead of having like these, you know, linear processing of ACLs, think about your rule explosion if you try to do dev prod seg and you don't even have any way of sort of doing that because they're all commingled. We use IP sets extensively and a lot of the existing endpoint enforcement solutions don't even understand what that is at this point in time. It could in the future. You know, the, we, we do extensive work to make that actually happen. However, if a third party wanted to leverage that then, they absolutely could. An example of sort of our openness is, you know, we did work with F5, right? So F5, you think about a VIP or virtual server inside of a legacy data center, it's a little bit like, okay, I'm gonna talk to the front end of the F5, but at the, uh, the virtual server at the back of it, you know, it's like a black hole for us because it's in the middle of things. So we actually talk I rules to the VIPs, we read them, and we actually program rules going into the virtual servers and out of the virtual servers uh, to basically make it part of the overall graph. So um, it's an example where we're not absolutely tied to being the only enforcement point in the world, and I think you'll see other things like that from us in the future. So just at a real high level, mm -hmm. I've got a brownfield data center. I have no form of security or micro-segmentation whatsoever. I have VLANs, but they're wide open. Yeah. I can wrap between them. So I come in with the Lumio. I install the PCE. Let's say I do it on-prem, and I install the VEN on all of my servers. Uh -huh. you know, I write the policy with the PCE. I push it down to the VEN, and it implements it in either Windows firewall rules or IP tables. Mm -hmm. What if I have a host that's breached and that you know, whatever it's breached with tries to rewrite IP tables, do I get some kind of alert that it's like, how does that work? So, so yeah, so, so there's a number of things, right? So one is you have um, tampering, right? So, we have, so if anybody tries to mess with the IP tables, we have tamper detection, you will get alert if that happens, right? If anybody tries to uh, you know, shut down the VEN, right, at that point the PCE will be notified that, that there's no longer a heartbeat to that VEN, that VEN is no longer running. Um, and the PCE can sh shun that workload from the rest of the application, and by shun means it will, you know, it will cut off connectivity. Um, and then the most important point, as I, I alluded to before, is because there's two points of enforcement, right? There is egress and ingress enforcement. So let's say you compromise one half of that, like you get onto the web workload, right? Um, you can't just, in a, let's say you were able to shut all that down, you can't still go anywhere, right? All the other places that didn't allow that web workload to talk before the event was compromised are still in place in the rest of the system to sort of prevent that from occurring. Gotcha, gotcha. What if you have another system that you're already using that needs to interact with IP tables? Can you play along with that or do you need to kind of completely take over the management of, of local firewall rules on the host? Well, again, that's right. IP tables does a whole bunch of different functions. It does NATing, so it does some networking functions, right? What what you know, uh, Docker and some of the overlay networking th systems do. And then there's kind of access control, filtering rules, right? Um, we, we sort of are in control of the filtering, and we can play nicely with some of those other things. So it depends on what the tool is, um, but but the goal is for us to be in charge of access control decisions. So as long as you don't have another piece of software that's also trying to write filtering rules, it should generally yeah, exactly. Yeah, gotcha, gotcha. And more generically, I mean, is, can you whitelist certain IP table rules and just not mess with those at all? So we, we actually provide tools. So like, to, for us to walk in and think that you don't already have IP tables rules would be a bit myopic. And if you don't mm -hmm. already know, I guarantee you, if you're having a Linux plant right now with developers, you have IP people writing IP tables rules. So we have a set of tooling that allows you to basically import, for us to import your IP tables rules and regurgitate them back onto the host. So uh, that was another one of those sort of learnings. People, a lot of our customers did not realize how much their devs were actually using IP tables or their DevOps teams were using IP tables. So we put some tooling in there to sort of assist in that integration. As far as your actual production deployments, you know, in theory, you could do this and be completely wide open at the network level. What do you see people doing? Do you see people, you know, using Illumio by itself? Do you see people? You see people also doing filtering at the network level. How do you kind of mesh together? So, so what we sort of see is kind of, I'll, I'll call it kind of coarse grain, fine grain, right? 
coarse grain sort of coarse grain is some it I mean a it's coarser grain like the and B it's more static right and that seems to be more appropriate for implementing inside you know networking infrastructure and fine grain very dynamic right, is where sort of Illumio shines so that's people will sort of people can still make VLANs right if they have VLANs that sort of uh, have some segmentation and security boundary then inside that VLAN or inside that that group they use Illumio to do the fine grain segmentation and that's kind of the and, and different different organizations have uh, that slider is in sort of different places. So. Yeah, maybe just one other thing that we were going to talk about is that we just encountered our first couple of customers that are actually building flat, wide open networks, and they're using Illumio effectively as the security control plane. They may still use some of those constructs for traffic performance. Uh, but one of our customers is building a large greenfield data center, and they are not doing internal segmentation or ACLs from a uh, security point of view. I'm not even meant to use, not using firewalls or ACLs. Now that's more on the newer cutting edge. And as I think we mentioned before is, you know, so in the brown field we have to deal with just kind of everything. Yeah. I mean, if you have 15, yeah, I'm going to say this, we're guy wearing a shirt that says, you know, simply tell that into Mordor. If you get 15 networking people in a room, you can get 45 opinions on the right way to do this. <laughs> All right. That's your question? Yeah. yeah okay. I have one, one more question. I think you're probably going to answer this in, in the next piece here. But when you were going through that rule creation, you had drop downs, you had application, environment, and location. Or how are those defined? Where did those come from? Like when you selected yeah. MFG or environment production? So the, lab, the question is what, how, where do the labels get generated from? I think is your question. And the answer is every customer seems to be different, right? So I would characterize the customers like at one end of the spectrum, we have customers with pristine CMDBs, okay? Uh, they are the exception, like you could count. Rarities. They're the exception <laughs> of the exception, right? Where they actually have really good uh, CMDBs. Um, and on the other side, there's customers that have nothing, okay? And so we can't be, once again, prescriptive about how this happens. So if you have a CMDB, you import the metadata in via our REST API, you match that up with the workload context, and boom, you're in business, right? That's a, that's a really nice situation. On some of them, um, what we'll see is like, you know, moving more towards the middle, they have dirty CMDBs, and they'll use Illumination, which I'm about to show you. We're gonna get to a demo of this, where they have a, there's a CMDB, and it is 20% you know, correct, okay? And so they'll use Illumination to help clean that up, and so we'll get some of the labels from there. We'll get some of the labels from you know sort of the the the, the graph cleanup process and to get that. And on the far left side or your right side, because you're facing me, um, we'll we'll start off with somebody that has no idea. There is no label construct, and we walk them through a process. That process is: Do you have dev, prod? Do you have PCI? Understand a little bit about the business. What are your subnets for location? So we've taken two care to take taken care of two of the dimensions right getting right off the bus. The role dimension is you know, fairly self straightforward to, to, to generate. And then there's the application dimension. Are you using Microsoft? OK, we're just taking care of some number of the, uh, of the applications in the environment. And then we get into the, the developer area, where we don't have any visibility. Like Everything seems to be bespoke in that area. Um, then we have to spend some time. Some customers have a secret decoder ring, where they put into the actual host names what they're actually used for. Some of them don't. Um, so we have to sort of tease that apart. Gotcha, gotcha. There's no one size fits all. Every once again, it's the 45 opinions with 12 people uh, problem because uh, every customer seems to have done things a little bit differently. So we have to sort of learn a little bit about their business. We are vendors. We don't really argue. Yeah, and so we do have tools. I mean, so, so when we we arm people with sort of tools and a toolbox to go into these environments to sort of detangle those things. You have the data visualization that goes along. I mean, there there is no one size fits all. But like giving people the right tools and the right data visualization helps them untangle Perfect. things. Right? I just see the screen and the first thing that comes to mind is please don't make me sit down and type in port numbers and subnets no, no. and manual. No, the context from the host helps quite a bit with that, and I'll show you in a minute. One last note, because I before we get into the illumination stuff. So I would like to tell you that everyone's writing these micro-segmentation policies. No, actually no. We, we could do that, no big deal. Most customers start off with a very simple application ring fencing policy, which is like, I want you know, the, my load balancers to be open to the outside world, and then I want anything labeled MFG to be able to talk to everything labeled MFG, and it basically puts a bubble around that application without having to write micro-segmentation policies. So that's where most customers start, because they like, they're going from everything's wide open east-west, they have some level of segmentation, but it probably you know, doesn't work so well. 
it's just a way of simply you know, vetting it out without having to get down to the port process protocol. Um, and not all applications are created equally. We have a customer who has a, literally, they have a beverage tracking application. They go fill up the beverages, and that application doesn't really need to be that as secure as the, you know, the financial serv the financial application, right? So micro you don't have to micro segment everything. And the beauty of this is you can get down to where the level you don't have to do everything uh, created equally. The other classic thing which I've seen in sort of mid-sized organizations is they put web in one or two VLANs, they put app in another VLAN, they put DBs in another VLAN, and their default policy is zone one can talk to zone two, zone two can talk to zone three, but then the beverage tracking application is in the exact same VLAN as the financial services application. So we can basically retro segment those applications without having to modify the underlying infrastructure. Okay? Let's get to illumination. Which I, think I, is, I just have one quick question. Okay, is there anything as far as um, audit tracking, as far as policies and rules that are created mm -hmm. that you may not use anymore that'll go back and make sure that those rules aren't just sitting there unused so that you've got holes in your network potentially that are going to leave you open for future attacks because they're not used anymore? So, so one of the first principles is we kind of follow the source control model for policy, right? So you'll sort of, there's a, there's a little one up there, which is um, that, that's, that's an unprovisioned policy. So it's like an uncommitted policy if you, you know, if you have that kind of skill. And then there's a whole history and with all the differences and all the people, so you can actually do a visual diff of policy. So there is the history. Okay. And then the other part of your question is kind of policy usage. It's like, there is a rule that is no longer, um, you know, in use any longer. So policy usage is actually on the, on the roadmap to be able to take that policy and merge it with traffic data to be able to actually say that this policy hasn't been used for the rest 30 days and maybe this is a candidate for sort of cleaning it up. So we have all that data and so we're sort of working on, you know, sort of merging those two things. But, but there's also sort of like, you know, if you think about middle boxes or just hitting ACLs and infrastructure, right? You don't really know if that policy is necessary because you don't have the context where that host is actually there. Um, if the host is there and the labels are there, the policy, you may, the policy may actually, actually have relevance. If the host goes away, the policies, you know, nothing's going to subscribe to that policy at the same time. So you have a little bit more granularity and fidelity when, when you write a policy. Because just because you author a policy, it's not going to open anything up in the middle. The only way that policy is going to be enacted is if you, you know, if you spawned a workload that actually subscribed to those labels, right? And the PCE was able, uh, and, and the PC actually plumbed the rules down to it. Okay. Anything else? Uh, All right. Yes, actually. No, good. Keep going. I, I didn't want to this be that guy. No, no, you can be that guy. Okay. So the bit, <laughs> the bit that I'm missing in this is um, the population of the initial data, right? So I have my 10,000 servers or VMs, whatever it is, and I might be able to, with some of them, say this is my prod zone, this is my dev zone. So some of that categorization I can probably do by IP out of the gate. Mm -hmm. However, saying this is part of this application and this is this role within an application, I, I'm assuming for the most part is going to be a manual process, at least that first time you spin everything up, right? Because we can't magically guess, or can we, where something sits in an application. And then the related question to that is, because there's always a follow-on, is if you move a VM, say, or we mentioned containers, I could spin up a container anywhere. So when that container comes up, what is it that identifies that as being a particular role and it, it, as part of an application versus when it's sitting over somewhere else, because presumably it's got to be instantiated and the policy's got to be pushed out pretty darn quickly, mm -hmm. but especially for a container that's only up for five seconds. Mm -hmm. So you don't have much time to go, oh, it's this, quick, PCE, send something to the VEN, push it into IP tables, oh, now the guy can take traffic. Right. So, so let me, I think we're, let me tease that question to two, okay? okay. I'm going to take the first part of it and I'm going to throw it over to PJ for the second, the container part of it because he's 10 times smarter than I'll ever be. So, uh, so the, the answer to that, to that, uh, to the first one is, okay, I have a set of VMs. They, yeah, you can give me the location and environment information based on IP, even though they may, that may or may not be accurate depending on where the customer is. In Illumination, we actually create a set of clustering algorithms that sort of figure out what is what the affinity is. So one of the things you can do is sort of uh, ignore dial tone services. Like I don't, in my illumination graph, I don't care about SSH, I don't care about DNS, I don't care about Nagios, and you'll start to see some clusters begin to form. That's one way that we do it. The other way is, uh, so I have zero idea, and I don't have the, I, we can export the workload catalog and actually help the customer, oh, I see there's Apache forked up on this, 
and if it's Apache, label it web. Uh, I see that it's Apache, and there's MySQL, and so it's a LAMP. Uh, <laughs> it, it's a LAMP developer. Um, label it full stack. You know, there's a bunch of things we could do to get the, the role label. Mm -hmm. The application label, that's the one, as I said earlier, it's a little bit uh, bespoke based on customers. Some customers put information actually in the host name. Sometimes we have to use the graph to figure out what actually an application is because we'll cluster them. Like these workloads seem to have a lot of affinity based on how they're communicating with one another. Obviously, we can't walk in. If you have a bunch of developers, we can, I can never tell you what your business is and tell you what the label should be. But we can say, these things are starting to look like an application. And oh, you use the secret decoder ring on the host name to determine what it is. Or oh, I run Puppet, and in my manifest, you know, here are the tags that are, are ascribed to those specific, specific workloads. So you know, every single customer seems to be a little bit different on how that actually works. Does that answer the first part of your question? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, and, okay. and, and I think, that certainly helps a lot. Yeah, yeah, and I think, I mean, you can sort of say, this is, like, I've identified an application. If you remember the picture I should have showed, right, you had the compute nodes and the etcd cluster, you could have just called it app A and app B, right? And you sort of said, okay, I can, I don't know what that is yet, right, but I can still put a ring fence around it, right? I haven't right. named it properly, but I have identified it, right? Um, and you give it a label, and then you can go rename the label later when you figured out what, what it is, but you can all, you could control, in, in, you know, e, you could have, you could have done a ring fence, say anything with those labels are allowed to talk to anything else, and then have uh, ingress and you know, rules to that application. You could have done that without knowing yet what it is. And then when you figure out what it is, you end up going to you know, talk to somebody. Um, you, can, you can then put up, you know, do the appropriate label. But you could have done policy before knowing all the details about the application. I mean, but it's, it's, it's probably easier if you know, right? Um, uh, I mean, you know, in real life, what we find is that you got a combination. There's a set of knowledge. And then there's the blind spots and the, so as Matt was saying, imagine you, were, you did the ring fence around app A and you're saying, why is that thing talking to? That usually gets kind of like the CISO's eyebrow to do the Jack Black trick where they move up and down and they want to investigate because uh, you know, we are 70% of the time primarily dealing with the security team, not the infrastructure team. Right, and because there was a great question earlier, who owns policy? Um, it is actually one of the interesting, most emerging challenges we have because we've taken layers down in the organization between security, infrastructure, and now increasingly DevOps. So who owns that is as much an organizational dynamic as it is a technical dynamic. And you know, we think this is kind of the beginning of a curve that's gonna go through IT for the next 10 or 15 years. Last note about the app name. Uh, hopefully we'll get there because we have a bunch of demos that I want to do for you guys. Um, we have multiple times when we're working with our customers, uh, this goes back to a question you asked earlier, they'll say, oh, we, I don't even know what my applications look like. And we'll actually run a parallel uh, illumination effort with them, right? And in that parallel illumination effort, um, we've done it multiple times for customers. We'll actually, we'll set up a PC on their side and they'll give us anonymized data on our side. Now the app names, frequently we don't know, because we don't want their, their data, they anonymize the heck out of it. That doesn't mean we can't author policy without the real app name on there. And I'll show you that in a little while, okay?